for helping us here. And thank you to all of you members. As Emily said, um, it means so much to us that you guys are supporting us, especially during this time. And unfortunately, we are still closed, but we wanted to create these virtual chats to create an opportunity to still be able to connect you with our amazing wildlife that we have here at the zoo. And um, the animals miss you, we miss you. So we can't wait to open up. We're not exactly sure when that's going to be. So stay tuned uh, to emails and to our website. But let's get to the show. We are and in South America, and we are at our jaguar habitat. Uh, Mara right now is in the habitat, and she is enriching the yard. Um, now, for Mara to be in the habitat, we're going to turn this around now. So Mara is our jaguar zookeeper, and what she's doing is putting what we call enrichment. And enrichment is anything that changes up the day-to-day -day life of our animals. That could be different scents or smells or toys. And the goal is to try to create some sort of a uh, interaction with those items that is more of a natural one. We're gonna try and move our camera. There we go. It looks like we were getting the glare of the sun. Perfect. Um, and this morning is an exciting one because we are gonna be giving Bella an oxtail. So an oxtail is a big piece of meat that you're gonna see Mara hanging up there. And we're hanging it in the tree in this fallen log to simulate a prey that a jaguar would be going for. Uh, jaguars, of course, are our largest cat in the Americas. So that is in North America, Central America, and in South America. Their range now is all the way in Southern United States, going into Central America, and then throughout most of South America. So it's pretty exciting. Within the last decade, we have evidence of jaguars being here in the United States. And in our backyard, which is in Southern Arizona, uh, also spanning into Southern New Mexico, uh, which is really cool because this is one of their uh, recent or historic habitats that we have seen jaguars. Uh, we have historical records of them being in here. Uh, but they, we haven't seen them in a long time until about a decade and a half ago when we had evidence of jaguars and we have video proof of uh, jaguars now being in southern Arizona and again in southern New Mexico. Uh, jaguars are solitary cats, so Bella is our 11-year-old female jaguar. Uh, she came to us just under a year ago from the Akron Zoo out of Ohio, and she came to us as part of what we consider an SSP, which is a species survival plan. Now that's where we work with the other AZA accredited zoos in the United States to shift and move animals. Some of those are due for breeding, so for breeding opportunities, and some of those are not. Uh, Bella right now is not a breeding animal, and Bella is coming out right now, so let's flip it back around. Um, we have Bella who's coming out. Now, of course, for Mara to be in the habitat, Bella was not able to be in there. We do have what's called protective contact, which, which is a barrier between us and that animal at all time. So we have off habitat spaces that we can secure our animals in. So it's safe for us to be able to go into the habitat, which is what you saw Mara. And then once Mara had enriched that habitat, uh, we were able to uh, let Bella out. So we can see Bella here. And again, she is our 11-year-old female jaguar, and she is fairly new to us. She came around November-ish, um, and uh, so hasn't been here for quite a year. And a lot of times what our animals are going to do when they first come out is kind of search their area. And this is a very common thing that a jaguar would be doing in the wild as well. Uh, they do have pretty large territories that they're going to um, be able to inhabit. And they're going to go through those territories. A lot of times they'll see them mark them um, and investigate, are there any other animals in that area? Um, is there a potential mate in that area? Is there a potential rival in that area? Uh, so what she's doing right now is a very natural behavior of just investigating and seeing what did Mara put out. Uh, she did put out, as we said, that oxtail, which is hanging from the branch. So hopefully we'll get an opportunity to see Bella go up and grab that. But she also put out a lot of different scents and smells, some lavender, and uh, those are very olfactory-driven enrichment, which, of course, cats love those. Uh, so they have very powerful noses that they're going to use to search out their prey. And uh, a lot of times, they love to rub different scents and smells on them. So when we're, we might see her 
uh, move some of that, uh, move her head on it or her paws on the lavender to get it on her. So it looks like she's climbing up the log here. So we see her climbing up. Now, jaguars are excellent climbers. Um, as I said, they're the largest cat in the Americas and they are an opportunistic ambush hunter. Uh, they hunt for their prey on the ground, uh, up in the air in our trees, and also in the water. They have a very wide range of species that they're gonna go after. She's knocking down one of the, that cube there. Um, and again, she's just kind of moving around right now and investigating. She will eventually find that oxtail. Um, so these guys will go after prey as small as birds, and as large as a taper, which can weigh several hundred pounds. Jaguars themselves typically range around 150 to around 250 pounds, and uh, some of them even upwards of 300, but that's fairly rare. Those some, we do have some records of some large males that are up around 300 pounds. Uh, and as I was saying, this is a large cat, so they are related to our leopard, our tiger, and our lion. Um, looks like she's going to be a little interested in us. Oh, there she goes. Now she's found it. Oh, so she looked at it. She's thinking about it. Um, so what we did is we uh, drilled a hole through that oxtail and hung a uh, PVC or a uh, fire hose through there with a chain to lock and secure it. So to, again, to create a little bit of a challenge for her. Um, these guys, as I said, are excellent hunters. Uh, oh, there we go. We're going to, oh, she, she was stepping on that little plate down there. It was right behind the ball. Um, there was a little scent and smell on there. And then she went right through that tunnel. So as I was saying, jaguars are related to our other large cats, our leopard, our tiger, and our lion. And they are all in the panthera family order. So our lion is panthera leo, our tiger is panthera tigris, our jaguar is panthera unca, and our leopard is panthera pardus. All of those are panthera, in which that means that they are all considered panthers. Now, what we're seeing with Bella in her coloration is what we would call a common coloration for a jaguar. You see that orange, reddish um, fur with those black rosettes, and that's a very common look that we would see a jaguar have. Every now and then you may see a jaguar that has a black coat, and that's what we would call a melanistic jaguar. Um, that is a recessive gene that gives that jaguar that black coat and that black coloration. And uh, a lot of times when people see a black jaguar, they call it a black panther, which isn't entirely wrong, but it's, some people believe that um, the black panther is its own species, which it is not. Any of our large cats can be considered a black panther if they have a melanistic coat. Uh, so that is the jaguar, the leopard, the tiger, the lion, all of them are considered panthers. So there is no such species as a black panther. Um, and of course, what connects all of them together is one, their large size, but also their unique cranial features. Uh, all those four cats have unique cranial features, so their skull, and also they have the ability to roar. And we used to think that that was a hardening of the hyoid bone, uh, but now research is showing us that it's actually more in the morphology of the larynx that allows these cats to be able to roar. Um, so our smaller cats will do the hissing um, and the purring. Our large cats will do a roar and a chuck. And true to cat nature, um, we can put out all these fun things and Bella wants to go and just hang out for a little bit and take a little rest on one of her favorite spots in the, in the cool shade right there. And again, all of our opportunities that we put out for our animals, they're all what we would consider opportunistic or optional. It's up to them. Um, they get to choose. And that's what's great about the enrichment that we do with the training that we do is that it's all choice based. So the animals get to choose what they want to do, what they want to interact with. Uh, we will do training with our animals, especially Bella. Uh, Bella loves working with her keepers. And of course, we don't go in. Again, we have protective contact, which is a barrier between us and the, and the animal. But she does come right up to our mesh here and interacts. But again, that's all choice-based because we only use positive reinforcement training. So it's up to her if she wants to participate. It's up to her if she wants to participate in the enrichment. Um, and those of you guys that may have cats out there, uh, you know that you can create an amazing array of opportunities for your cat and they may just go to sleep in the box that all your toys came in. 
Uh, that's very similar to, to, to our cats here. Um, Bella is still a cat. Uh, even though she's a large cat, she's still a cat. And uh, we'll do all those great cat things. And just like she's doing right now, is she wants to lay down and hang out, which is totally fine. Uh, Bella is full grown, so she won't get much bigger than this. And as I said, she, right now, she does not have a breeding recommendation. We do work with that species survival plan to uh, make sure that we're being responsible with all of our accredited facilities in which animals breed and how many opportunities they have to breed. So jaguars are solitary. She is our only cat. This is how they would be in the wild. We are the only social cat in the world is the lion, which we have a multi, multiple uh, lions in that habitat. But for this one, as a companion animal, they just really do not need that sort of uh, a resource. Um, so that's why Bella is on her own in here. And she had, this, is what, this, this is what they do. This is what they love. Um, and when we renovated this habitat in anticipation of bringing Bella in, we looked at a lot of enhancements. One of them is our mesh to be able to do training. Uh, also, we talked about those eye bolts that are kind of all around the habitat. They give us an opportunity to hang things like our oxtail today. And we expanded our pool. Um, right now, our pool is empty because we wanted to try to focus our attention on some of our other enrichment. Uh, but uh, that's going to get filled up later today. Jaguars do swim. Uh, whether or not they enjoy it or not is left up to the imagination. Uh, most jaguars we see swimming in the wild are doing so either to catch prey like a caiman, uh, which is a crocodilian species, and or they're swimming to get to the other side of the river um, or whatever that water source is. So, but they do go in, they do hunt for fish, they hunt for caiman, um, and Bella does enjoy going in every now and then. We'll hang some of her toys down there and um, she definitely will go down in there and interact with those toys. Uh, getting into the hunting of jaguars, which is really impressive, that really separates them from some of our other cats is not only the way they hunt in that they have the ability to do it in water and land and up in the trees, but also the way they kill their prey. So a lion, a tiger, a leopard, they're typically going to suffocate or um, kill that animal, their prey, by a crushing blow to the throat or to the back of the neck a jaguar will go right for the skull. And pound for pound, they have the strongest jaw pressure of any cat in the world and second strongest of any mammal just under the hyena. So a tremendous bite pressure on um, that these animals have and they utilize that to subdue their prey because a lot of times their prey is larger than them. So they don't want to mess around and they're dealing with a crocodilian like a caiman. They're dealing with um, a large animal like a taper. Um, those animals definitely are going to fight back. So being able to subdue and kill your prey efficiently and quickly uh, allows those animals to be able to hunt those larger prey and be very efficient. The, also, the other thing that's great about jags is that they're not picky. They're not picky eaters. Um, some other prey or some other predators out there are very picky eaters and or they only have a select narrow opportunity of prey to be able to hunt. Uh, jaguars will really go for anything. They are the apex predator in their habitat, which means that they are at the top of the food chain, which makes them really a keystone species in those habitats as well, because our apex predators are the ones that really control all of the prey and their population growth. We know that if we remove our apex predators and our prey species get out of control, they can devastate the ecosystem. Those prey species require a lot of resources and it's the apex predators that keeps those animals in check. So an animal like a jaguar is so important to their habitat. Uh, these animals are listed as near threatened so they're a near threatened species and they are near threatened on what we call the IUCN red list. Sorry, I got a plane flying over. I'm gonna wait till the plane goes by. Sometimes it can be a little bit distracting um, with the plane going over. Um, so the, they're consistent, they're, uh, they're uh, listed as uh, almost or near threatened on the IUCN, uh, which is the International Union for conservation of nature. That is the organization that goes out and tracks numbers, births, deaths 
as best as we can to get an idea of a number that that species has. And if that number starts to decline to a point where um, they're in a lot of trouble, that's when we start listing them as threatened, uh, near threatened, critically endangered, endangered, all those, those animals then get that insignia on them. And then by doing that, other conservation methods will go into place to help protect those species. Uh, one of the biggest problems with jaguars right now is their habitat, their fragmentation of the habitat. Uh, these guys, as I said, have very wide ranging habitats because they need a lot of space uh, for those different prey. And what's happening is their habitats are being fragmented. And so if you have a great uh, space, but your corridors, your migration corridors get cut off, then those animals can't move from one side to the other. So they get basically marooned in a specific area. Even though that area may be large, they can't move out of that area. And what that does is it shrinks down the gene pool of the population. It limits the amount of individuals that they're going to be able to interact with, um, which decreases the genetic variability of the species, which can be detrimental to the species and to the future of them. Um, so things like roads, things like walls, things like farms, buildings, all those things are going in the middle of the jaguar habitat spanning again from uh, southern United States going all the way down into South America. And if we fragment those habitats too much, we may lose this species, which would be very sad to, do, to see as the largest cat in the Americas. So uh, how do the zoos help? How do we help and how do you guys help? Well, you guys are doing that right now. Uh, you guys are doing that by tuning in and hopefully learning something new about a jaguar. Uh, also, that education and that knowledge and that connection will transcend into you hopefully doing an action. And that action could be as simple as telling somebody else that jaguars are really cool. Uh, it could also go into saving what we call fossil fuels because that's one of the main reasons that these habitats are being fragmented. And so if we uh, use less fossil fuels, then the need to consume more in these habitats goes down and therefore the habitats can restore and we can see a thriving species in our jaguars. Uh, so we can do simple things like uh, ride share. Now, right now may not be the best time to ride share because we are in a pandemic and we do want to uh, practice social distancing, um, but carpooling with uh, your uh, quarantine circle is still a good opportunity. And when we get out of this uh, pandemic that we're in, you know, think of trying to do ride sharing or uh, carpooling or even biking. Biking is a great way uh, to be able to commute, which decreases our need for fossil fuels in our cars. Uh, so those things and also saving energy whenever you can at your house, turning lights off, um, switching to low energy bulbs. Um, if you have the opportunity to do solar panels, all those things help to decrease the need for those fossil fuels and which help out all of our animals. So there's something that all of us can do. Uh, one of the biggest things that you guys are doing is you guys are supporting your local zoo. You guys are supporting us by being members. By supporting us, you guys are allowing us to do conservation globally. Reed Park Zoo is a mecca for conservation and we do projects all over the world. Now, not specifically with jaguars, uh, but we do have an anteater project that we are doing where we are uh, working to track anteaters in the Pantanal down in Brazil and uh, with Dr. Arnaud Debier. And what he's doing is setting up protected land. Now, if we set up protected land for an anteater, guess who else lives with an anteater? A jaguar. So we can protect the land for the anteater and the jaguar and the taper and the caiman and all the amazing birds and insects and everything else that lives with them. So we can use those species as catalysts to really be able to make a difference. So while Bella is sitting right here, clearly uh, not interested in our oxtail, uh, Emily, do we have uh, some questions that we can answer? I did see uh, somebody say, ask, uh, what's the lifespan of a jaguar? Um, and we don't have a median life expectancy. Right now, Bella is 11. Um, she is considered an adult and jaguars could live somewhere between about 18 and 20 years, but we don't have enough of those species documented 
that have lived birth to death to be able to get a good median life expectancy. Uh, so summer probably around 18, 16 to 18 is a really good estimate, uh, but that's just an estimate. And you know we could have some that don't quite live as long and some that definitely live a little bit longer. So uh, Emily, do we have any other questions we can answer during this time? Yes, uh, we have a couple. Um, so we know that jaguars like to climb. Are they good jumpers? They are. They are excellent jumpers as well, not only vertically up to be able to grab something or to grab onto a tree, but they will also leap from uh, one stand post to another. Uh, so they have a leap of about 15 feet um, from one tree to the other, and they are extremely nimble. It is a uh, thick body, powerful, muscular cat. They will use that tail a little bit for balance. Um, it's a shorter tail than some of our other cats because it's a short body. So they don't have as long a tail as say a cheetah does because that cheetah needs that longer tail as they're running fast as a rudder. Uh, but uh, yes, excellent jumpers, uh, really a, a solid athletic cat. I mean, if I was going to pick probably what the most athletic cat in the world is, I would pick the Jaguar. Uh, they have the, the most versatility and um, you know their, their function. So uh, I would say the Jaguar is probably the most agile and athletic cat in the world. That's a bold statement though. So I might get people that are, that are chiming in saying, no way, it's gotta be the leopard or the caracal or... All right, Emily, what else? Uh, let's see. Um, so you did mention that they are apex predators, uh, but do they have any known predators besides humans or just us? They do not. So the apex predator, again, they're top of the, they're top of the food chain. So um, the only predator that they have is the unnatural one, of course, of us. Um, that is another reason why their uh, species is in decline, is that we um, humans have illegally hunted or poached these animals uh, for their parts. Uh, a lot of times it's their coats. They have a beautiful coat. Um, some people think that that coat looks better on them wearing to a fancy ball or something. Uh, I think it looks better on the Jaguar, but uh, that's a personal opinion, I think. Uh, and then also sometimes their parts will be used, their bones will be used for uh, witch doctors and uh, traditional medicine that, again, don't have any purpose other than, um, you know, eliminating a cat. Uh, these guys will also have run-ins with farmers. And so uh, Amazon is in the Amazon, the Amazonian farmers, if a Jaguar is hunting their livestock, they will go out and hunt the jaguar. So that's another point of conservation and how we can mitigate that is setting up one, a different revenue stream for those farmers than maybe as big as their livestock crop is. Um, and or we can supplement those farmers with conservation money for animals that had been taken by a jaguar. Um, so uh, the human conflict is their only um, source of you know, being a, a predation. All right, and uh, another one. Um, do jaguars typically prefer to be active during the day, at night, or any time? Yeah, and it's uh, interesting to get with the jaguars. These guys are typically active throughout the day and night. Um, historically, we would see other cats uh, choose, you know, so you have your diurnal hunters like a cheetah, you have more of your nocturnal or crepuscular hunters like the lions and the leopards. Uh, crepuscular is animals that are active during dusk and dawn, so just as the sun is coming up and just after the sun has sat. Uh, and uh, jaguars are very opportunistic, and so she could be laying here and all of a sudden a prey could come right by her path and she decides this is the time she wants to hunt. Um, and they are excellent nocturnal hunters as well. Um, so if she's hungry and hadn't found food during the daytime, hunting at night would be an opportunity as well. Uh, so again, just a very versatile cat in, um, in what they're doing. Excellent. Uh, and then we have another question. Uh, does Bella have any special habits particular to her that we've observed since she's moved with us? Yeah, Bella's a little bit of a silly cat. Um, and, you know, each animal has their own unique personalities. Uh, Bella definitely has hers. 
Um, she's not really a sassy cat. Uh, she does like to, you know, relax and sleep. And she does like to interact with her keepers, which is, um, you know, you don't see that in all Jaguars. So she's got uh, her own unique personality. She loves birds. So she loves to watch birds, um, which, is, which is fun to be able to see. And uh, yeah, I mean, she's just a really great cat. And, um, you know, she's, she's been a lot of fun to have here. And we're hoping uh, for years to come, she'll grow and, uh, and, and more and more people will grow to love her. Let's see. Uh, this might, these two might kind of tie in a little bit. Uh, what is Bella's strongest sense? Um, you know, is it smell, hearing or, or whatnot? And then do big cats like catnip, like regular domestic house cats? Catchy, gotcha, yeah. So, um, her senses are very acute, so she's got sense of vibration and so sense of feel and the smell, the taste, and her hearing. And in a thick jungle, the number one thing that she's going to be using is her ears. Um, it's tough to smell through uh, thick jungle forest, and it's tough to see through all of that foliage as well. Um, so she has very acute hearing. Now, as she gets closer to the prey, all those other senses are really going to kick in. So we use ears first, and then once we start getting closer, we start developing our smell to track exactly what we're doing. And then once we get closer, we're using that binocular vision to be able to zero in and focus in on our prey. And as all predators, her eyes are facing forward. So we always say eyes in the front, ready to hunt, eyes on the side, ready to hide. So as a predator, her, her eyes are focused forward that allows her to have that binocular vision so she can, change, so she can um, uh, test that depth perception. So she knows how far away an animal is, how fast does she need to run, how far does she need to jump to be able to grab a hold of that prey. So all those things, if you can imagine a funnel, and as we're at the top, at the, at the widest part of that funnel is our ears start moving down into our eyes and then to our nose um, and, uh, or sorry, the eyes and nose and then uh, into the eyes. And then of course, that's when we're gonna attack. Uh, so the ears are her number one sense that she's gonna be you know, located in her environment. And what is the furthest north uh, in Arizona that we've had Jaguar sightings, do you know? Um, I don't know in what the Jaguar Alliance is doing. The Skyline Alliance is the conservation organization um, that is tracking the Jaguars in Southern Arizona. Um, and understandably, they're keeping a lot of the locations of where the Jaguars are uh, secret. Um, they don't want anybody going out there and one getting injured by a Jaguar and inadvertently, she's catching bugs, <laughs> um, and or going and disturbing the habitat. Um, and or going and hunting the animal. Uh, so we don't have exact locations of where the jaguars are at. Uh, we know they're in Southern Arizona. Uh, we know that they are in Southern New Mexico, uh, but the exact locations and how far north up into Arizona they go, I do not have that. And when Bella came to us uh, last year, uh, did she have sort of an adjustment period with her new habitat and getting used to her new surroundings? Yeah, all animals have a bit of an adjustment and I try to kind of associate that to us. If anybody has moved to a different house or moved to a different state um, or moved out of the house, maybe uh, as going to college, um, you know, there's, there's definitely an adjustment period uh, where we've got to learn uh, our new area, our new spaces and our new keepers, uh, potentially some new food, um, and so there, yeah, there's always a, an adjustment period. Uh, we take that into account and we work very, very slowly with our animals to help them adjust to all those things. Um, so we try to uh, read a lot of their behavior. So are they showing us that we need to step backwards a little bit? Are they wanting a little bit more? And so that's the job of our animal care professionals to be able to really read those uh, Bella did really well. Um, we were, did give her access so she could go in and out of her behind the scenes space and on main habitat. So those of you guys that may have come uh, while she was in that transition phase, 
Sometimes she was in the back of the habitat where you couldn't see her, and sometimes she was out. And again, that's that transition phase where we're allowing her to choose um, where she wants to be and where she's most comfortable. Uh, we also interact a lot with her previous zoo. So the Akron Zoo, uh, we talked with their keepers. We have all of her medical records. We have all of her notes. Um, we have her keepers that are telling, her, telling us her likes, her dislikes. Um, and so we have a little bit of a cheat book uh, that we can use before she even comes that allows our keepers to, uh, you know, even have that much more of an edge. She also came with some of her favorite toys. Um, so we had a shipment from the Akron Zoo, uh, some of her favorite toys. Uh, so it's kind of like taking your memorabilia or whatever to, you know, a new place. Um, something that you know and you remember that helps with that transition. So yeah, each animal transitions a little bit differently. Um, she has you seen right here. She's completely comfortable just hanging out. We really wish you would try to go for this oxtail that's hanging so you guys could see that power and, um, you know, her rip that apart. But um, again, a cat is a cat and we can't make her do it. She looks pretty comfortable over there. Um, let's see. Do we know what uh, exact date is her birthday? Um, we think it's around... Yeah, we have it. I don't, I don't have that on hand though. So um, I know that uh, somewhere around maybe February, March um, ish. So she turned 11 right after she got here. Uh, so, but I don't have the exact date. <clears throat> and um, with, you know, uh, ex the expansion that's going to be going on and um, other animals moving around, is there any thought being given to moving uh, Bella to a different habitat or a different location within the zoo? Right now there's not. Uh, this habitat is designed for a jaguar so it has all of the key features that the species needs and can thrive and be successful. Um, in our phase three of the master plan we are going to be looking at South America so this area right now uh, we are in phase one of our master plan where we have broken ground and started construction in our front plaza for our front plaza new entry and also for our new flamingo habitat. So we, are, we have started phase one. Uh, when we get to phase three of our master plan, that will really be looking at South America and what species, you know, either move to a different space, um, habitats change up. Uh, and so, it, you know, it's not out of the question down the road, but for right now, we don't have a plan to be able to relocate her to another space. Thank you. And you had mentioned the SSP, the Species Survival Plan, and um, she's not currently part of that, correct? But do we know uh, if there's any hope for a mate in the future or anything along those lines? Yeah, that's correct. So the Species Survival Plan is the um, entity of the AZA, which is the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. Um, that it regulates really the breeding of animals. So what animals are breeding with who, how many offspring they have. And again, we wanna be responsible in when we're breeding our species uh, so that one, there's, a sp there's somewhere for that animal to go as they get older. As I said, jaguars are solitary animals. Uh, so if Bella was to have an offspring, um, that offspring at some point would need to go to a different facility. Um, and then also, um, you know, the genetic variation in them. So we don't want too many of the same uh, genetic variables to continue on in that species. So uh, Bella right now does not have a breeding recommendation. We don't know if that will change in the future. We uh, will work with our SSP coordinators and the Jaguar stud book and uh, AZA. And if that happens in the future, um, we will look at that the habitat is not designed to have two cats in it though. Uh, so if we were to, if she did have a breeding recommendation, she would probably go to a different facility. Because again, if we were to have a male jaguar here, we'd have to have a whole separate habitat and then only put them together during breeding season and then separate them. Um, so this habitat is not large enough uh, for two uh, cats that are not related. Thank you. That was a really excellent answer. Uh, and then I think last one uh, and wrap things up. Um, since we're on the topic of big cats, do we have any 
plans to uh, get tigers in the future. Yes, I know you guys probably all heard the sad news of the passing of Sita, um, who was our Malayan tiger. Uh, she was 18 years old, an extraordinary, 19 years old, sorry, 19 years old, um, an extraordinary cat. And um, with that habitat, again, we are going to work with our AZA colleagues. Um, we will work with our internal colleagues, um, so our animal care professional, professionals, and um, we will come up with a plan for a species in that habitat. Now, part of the master plan for phase one is an Asian expansion. Um, that's what we'll be working on once the front entry is complete and the flamingo habitat is complete. We will be expanding the zoo four acres to the west. In that, we will be building a brand new tiger habitat. So tigers will be here at the zoo. That space is gonna go from uh, the current habitat that the tigers were in, which was 3,000 square feet to over 17,000 square feet. Um, and it will have the ability to have multiple tigers in it so we can participate in the SSP for tigers in the breeding program. Um, whether or not we get tigers right now before that habitat is complete, again, we're gonna go to the planning and we wanna make sure that we're very responsible about what we're doing. Um, so we do not have an answer on what uh, species is gonna go into that habitat, but I can guarantee you when we have that, and when we know, we will definitely get that information to all of you guys. Perfect, I think that answered almost all of the questions uh, that we had today. Um, so thank you, Jed, uh, that's excellent and um, you know, she didn't go after that ox bone, but she did sit there very prettily for us for the last half hour. Um, is there anything else you wanted to say before we wrap up? Yeah, I just wanted to thank everybody. And again, you guys are members. It means so much to us on um, the dedication that you have to the Reed Park Zoo. Um, we have seen so many letters, so many emails uh, reaching out to us. How are the animals doing? How are we doing? How is the zoo doing? And I just want to let you know that you guys, you guys are keeping us going through this. Um, everything that you guys are doing, if, uh, whether or not it's a donation, whether or not it's letting us know that you guys care, it really means so much. So thank you for joining us for our very first virtual chat. And again, Bella didn't quite go for what we wanted to. Uh, Saturday, we are going to be catching up with our elephant supervisor, Cassie, and our baby elephant, Penzi. So every Tuesday and Saturday at 9 o'clock, we're going to be doing a chat like this. So we hope that you guys can join us uh, for some fun behind the scenes, up close informational opportunities for our virtual chats. So with that, I say goodbye. Um, enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Uh, and hopefully we will see you here on Saturday and at the zoo very soon.